Hello and welcome to Super Connectivity. I am your humble host, Charlie, the Professor Esser. And with me, as always, is the man with the plan, the man with the knowledge, the man who fills me in on what I do not know. And there's a lot of that. Phil, fill me in, Parrish. Hey, Phil. Glad to have you here. Glad to have you anywhere, Phil. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> no, you know, Phil, honestly, he's going to tell you, Phil. You know, when I started Super Connectivity 243 years ago with Rob Southgate, <laughs> Uh, who was my first co-host? Um, I uh, I could have lost interest had it not been for a plucky young, like in- insanely young millennial, Generation Y, as we used to call them in my day, uh, who sh- stepped up and said, "Hey, I'd love to do a podcast with Charlie Esser. That sounds like fun." And uh, I roped you into this. And now, Phil, in many ways, you have become my mentor as well. Um, You know, uh, honestly, I don't know much. I only know what I know. And I speak about it a lot. But there are men like Rob Southgate and Phil Parrish who have, and David White, I'll give him the props too, who have uh, guided me on this podcasting wonder over the years. And, uh, man, I'm I'm glad I searched... um, I'm glad I searched Marvel podcasts in the in the YMCA one day to listen when I work out. Because that's how I found Enough Said. That's how I found Rob Southgate. And that's how I found uh, Phil and Dave. And, and of course, uh, my sister from another mister, Lilith Hellfire. <laughs> there you have it. The yeah, super and- secret origin of Charlie Esser. Yeah, well, I don't think it's much of a secret. It's just that it's a lot of issues to read. Um, and Lilith, <laughs> if you ever listen to Super... We're going to have to do this test. We'll see if Lilith ever actually hears this. Um, Lilith, you made me mad to buy a comic book that wasn't an Archie today. Because I really wanted to buy this issue, this week's Josie and the Pussycats. And I was like, oh, no, I got too many books. And, man, curse you, DC and your substandard books. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> uh, sounds, sounds like a SmackDown on episode nine of Capes and Lunatics. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I, honestly, that Jughead, I mean, and for what it's worth, Jughead was written by Mark Wade, you know, who is a great writer. Um, I, I, uh, I'm now like, man, I want to explore this Archie's universe more. And, you know, I don't know if I want to go into that main, it, main book. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, hey, I went to DC with Superman. And I think that was a great jumping on point for me. But usually I want to be on those edges. I want to be on that obscure. I want, I, I want to be on the ephemera of a comic book uh, uh, grouping. I just think mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's like where you want to be. Because you're going to find your niche, your niche, your niche, uh, depending on where you're from and how you pronounce that word. Um, and then from that niche, you can move into where you like the rest of it, you know? I mean, Mm -hmm. as as I always say, you know, when I got into Marvel, it was with Conan. You know, Conan the Barbarian Mm -hmm. was really one of my, one one of the first real Marvels I got obsessive about. Well, that's what Um, I, that's what what I've said. I mean, I've said it before. Those, uh, like, fringe properties are like gateway drugs for comics because that's how I got into Marvel was the Transformers Mm -hmm. comics. Exactly. And, and you know, I was just, I was just, uh, we'll get into that in a minute. But yeah, I was listening to enough, uh, not enough said. Wait, wait, uh, the wait, wait podcast um, with uh, Graham McMillan and um, Phil Lester. Um, it's a great podcast. I do listen to it. It's ungodly long. Um, and as far as I know, it's the only podcast those two do. So I don't know why they're doing all that talking on that one podcast. Like, make six different podcasts. They actually have two. They do have the Baxter building. And that, and there's stuff that I'm like, here's a thing about podcasters. And this is what I think differentiates, like, good podcasters from podcasters who are good but aren't good people. Um, it's when you go back into old issues. 
and you judge them with your grown-up brain, thinking that these were written for grown-ups. Written in 1983, wasn't written for the for you know a 40 year old man, you know, and you know, granted, yeah, it's not what we would do right today, mm-hmm. but it's it's something that was written with the understandings of someone who who grew up in the 60s with, with, with their progressive ideals, which were you know probably not the progressive ideals of 2018. And, you know, and with the writing caliber that had to speak to, you know, not for nothing, my son Tristan, because that was what those were written for, you know. And Greg Tristan is, is a great, brilliant child who enjoys monsters. And so he was really happy to read this week's issue of Gwen, of Gwenum verse, Gwenum. Um, yes. Oh, he, he heard his name. So he wants to come on camera. He's a knight. He went to medieval times today. Um, okay. You want to take uh, Gwen, Gwenum and finish the book? Or did you finish it already? Okay, you go finish it. I don't know. I had to take your bookmark right to, so I could read it. Um, yeah. Uh, um, you know, uh, though I will say that uh, Edge of the Venom Venomverse uh, number two with Gwenpool was a really good book. Um if for nothing else, just because uh, the Venom, the Venom symbiote, because it's corresponded to Gwenpool, now has now had its understanding of comic book universes, so it makes the point to her: don't worry, this isn't a canon story. <laughs> you know, you know, and, and it's like it's like wait, you can you have that alternate dim- alternate dimension uh, perception? He says, well, only because I'm bonded to you. Because what you have, I have, and I can tell from what you have, from what you know, this you this isn't you know. For what it, I mean, in a way, it's kind of a dig on Gwenpool. It's like, look, they're not going to bond you, Gwenpool, to the Venom symbiote. That's just not marketable. Um, but I think Charlie's going to buy it. But who else? But I think the like the original point you're making is like, um, you could tell like a shift, like when comics shifted. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. It seems like. Around the first civil war, first civil war, or like in two thousand five, comics seem to like age up. You want to say, you know, that you could well, say, well, that they, you know, some, yeah. some of it's definitely not for children, or you know, not for young children. Yeah, here's what I will say, and I think this is the problem for me on on finding that point, is I think I, I think the Gen Xers are the generation that made the transition because I think because what it was is the Gen Xers. You know, we kids from the 80s um, or these we kids from the 70s and 80s, we were the kids who f- had the first group of 60s kids who started writing comics. So that was the first time that there were comics written by adults who had been kids. Mm-hmm. And so when the kids who had read the comics became adults, they started to infuse adult, adultism with an understanding that our marketplace is still kids. And what happened is, is as those kids grew up who were reading the adult comics for kids, got into writing comic books, you know, they kept on moving the bar up and up and up. So that now I think comics are in many ways written for people that are teens and above. So basically, as the fans grew up and became the creators, the characters kind of grew up too. Well, yeah, because you because you wind up with a much more complex story. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, interesting in, interesting enough, Alan Moore of all people with his uh Tom Strong books and, and several others really wanted to go back to a more classic comic book thing. And he did that with his nine with his nineteen sixty six uh series. He did like a sixty six that he did with Marvel, where he was doing he was essentially watchmening all the Marvel characters, creating pastiches of everyone. But he, he had too many conflicts with, with editorial, you know. Editorial is always a problem for 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 guys that imagine themselves true artists. Um, 
And I say artiste as opposed to artist because, you know, no one who is an artist actually calls himself an artiste. No. Um, I mean, I mean to Alan Moore all the time, but that's okay. We're friends. We can do that. Um, not really. Not at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, but that is, that is, that is what's interesting about comics. And for me, when I listen to Wait, Wait, which I do love, and right now they're running through uh, the fan. I mean, they've been doing, they have this podcast called The Baxter Building, which is on their main feed. And I'm plugging the heck out of them. And I'm going to tell you, it's a good feed. If you want to just listen to some really intense comic book conversations, Wait, Wait and, and Baxter Building are really good. Um, but the problem is for me is that when they do approach these things, they do approach them as old men rereading comic books that they read when they were 10 and 11 and saying, oh, his, his, his perceptions of the world aren't as evolved as mine today. And it's like, well, dude, your perceptions of the world weren't as evolved as they were when you were 11 either, you know? I'm not going to say what your world was, but I'm going to wager that probably you have grown and matured since you were 11. And the one, world you knew, one would you, hope. One would hope. One, one, one imagines, you know. Well, and this is actually something I always come back to. You know, you know, I love Bugs Bunny. I think most people really enjoy Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and Porky Pig and Yosemite Sam and the entire Looney Tunes crew. The fact of the matter is, is that there was a lot of adult humor that did go over our heads. And we now, now as adults, know that stuff when know there was a humor that was meant to go over kids' heads. I think too many people think they got it when they were kids. I think too many ki- adults today think, oh, yeah, I totally got what the subversity of Bugs Bunny was back when I first saw it and I was eight. It's like, no, you thought it was funny that there was a guy in a dress. You know, you know. Not for nothing. You thought it was funny that that there was, in many ways, gay panic jokes in Bugs Bunny, which is all gay panic jokes. Now, you can repurpose what was done in that and to say, no, it's actually a really loving story of a trans rabbit and a uh, closeted gay man who is seeking uh, happiness. But at the end of the day, the joke was, hey, look, it's a rabbit in a dress, and the, and the dumb guy don't know it's a rabbit in a dress. Well, you once, know? once again, look at the time they were created, they, those cartoons were created in, too. Yeah, well, no, yeah. and, but, but for what it's – and I'm not, I'm not faulting that because, honestly, that's a funny joke. The idea that, oh, you don't realize that's Bugs Bunny in a dress, that's a funny joke because it's obvious to everyone else. That's the joke of it is that you make a joke on a dumb guy by making the, the answer obvious. You know, like when you have, we want to emphasize that this character is not intelligent. And the best way to do that is to show that he does not see through what is a clearly a bad costume. You know, and then of course you get to Tiny Toons and they hang a hat on it, which is that they out and out say, villains are always fooled by bad costumes, um, which is a common book trope. But of course, Tiny Toons came out when I was a teenager and felt so uppity with my brain and, 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 and all full of my knowledge. And of course it's written by people that were nerdy kids when I was a kid who, as they grew said, we're going to hang a hat on everything and we're all going to laugh because we're in on, in on the joke. <sighs> this was not what I wanted to talk about today. Cause what I wanted to talk about today, Phil is Easter eggs. But first, before we get into this, do you want to rant in any way about uh, old people saying we're so much smarter now than we were when we read these the first time? No, let's keep no, let's keep away from that because I'm about I'm almost there. So yeah, <laughs> it's like what it's just I like, like those books. It's just like back back in my days in the nineties, or you know. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, the, yeah, I have know. you seen? I mean, it's, it seems like the '90s are making a big comeback, especially in comics. I mean, I mean, look at the Spider-Man oh, yeah. books. You got you got Scarlet Spider. You got Spider-Man 2099. Uh, well, of course, they, they made the announcement today. They're bringing back at least for an issue uh, that uh, Azrael was Batman. I mean, the '90s are rocking strong. I guess is that because they're not bringing in younger fans and if they're like oh these all these people are people who read comics in the 90s 
Well, you know what it is, is that you get, well, it's the conund- it's the business conundrum of catering to, to a more sophisticated audience. Essentially, comic books raise their prices so that a kid can't go out with his allowance money and buy four or five comics. And that's the thing. It's like, you know, a kid right now, I mean, I don't know what kids get today in allowance, but I know that a working class kid isn't getting 20 bucks a week allowance, you know? So if it, let, let, and, and let's say for argument's sake, they are, how many comics can you get for 20 bucks? You can get five. You know. Yeah, exactly. I know. Cause that's my, that's how much I spend on comics a week. You know, I, you know, and when, Mar- it, and when Marvel's pump, and when Marvel's pumping out like 90 books a month, it's like, well, I know I guess so. that's what I'm going to tell you is like me as an adult grown man with a regular job, And I put my numbers at 20 bucks a week because I know, and that's because I have rent and everything else. Now, a kid doesn't pay rent, but I'm going to wager most parents aren't spending rent money on their kid's allowance, you know? Um, So you're immediately, automatically attracting an older crowd, you know? Or you're only attracting children of other nerds. You know, I think what is the importance of cheaper comic books is that you get kids interested who don't have it at home. So, like, your kids, my kids, we our kids are going to know comic books. They're going to know science fiction. They're going to know whatever we find as our interesting genre tropes. But there may be kids that are just as nerdy as you and I are whose parents don't have a picture of Spider-Man in them, you know? Um, And, you know, they might get it from the TV and the movies, but the, the attraction is not there. And of course, I think where you're at with comic books now is that they've, they, they have shrunk their market to older folks and I think that's that's their problem. But I always say that that's their problem is that they don't have a regular. They don't have you know you know what they need to do. I mean, mm-hmm. honestly, if they were smart, they they need to create. And how to get these out there? They need to create like. They need you know what? Here's what here's what I want to tell you. They need to do what the Archies have done. Which is every grocery store I go into, I find Archie digests for pittances. And it's all just reprints of Archie's. You know? But kids who see that, whether they're young boys who see the Betty and Veronica summer special with girls in bikinis, or or little little kids who see Archie and Jughead making a joke on the cover and want to read it. You know, if we're looking at a a resurgence of Archies, I think that may be why. Because I think the Archies have embraced this idea that, no, you have to get kids reading your comic books and then have them age into your books, not Mm -hmm. have them, not have them be, be um, unable to comprehend it. When I was a kid, you know, as the comic books matured, so did I. And so when I'm reading, you know, the evolutionary war, you know, I'm in a place that my mind can, you know, as ham handed and as weak as their arguments are, I'm in a place where I can understand them and work with them and see there's something deeper than just superheroes punching each other at play here, you know? And I think that's, that's the thing is that we don't have that natural growth anymore because now, it's adults who read books written by adults who read comics reading comics. We don't have anyone writing for kids anymore. Well, see, I got reminded of this this week because me and my son have been reading comics and we started reading, we were, were rereading Untold Tales of Spider Man. Remember in, the, in mm-hmm. like the mid 90s when books were what, 150 or a dollar mm-hmm. fifty or were they more? Yeah. They had like this line of like 99 cent books, like Untold Tales of Spider Man. Well, wasn't there a Fantastic Four book? there was an avengers book or something but they were 99 cent books mm-hmm. and i think they said they, they might have been geared for kids but i mean i read them as like you know an older teenager and i you know they, they were still entertaining it's like 
Mm-hmm. That's what Marvel needs. They need in continuity books, maybe for a cheaper price. Hook, you know, hook the kids and. Yeah, well, that's what everyone needs, you know. I mean, oh, DC yeah. at least has at least a line of two ninety nine books, mm-hmm. you know. Um, although I do, you know, that's the thing is I do read a DC book and I do feel there's way less content I'm getting for that two ninety nine. And I th- and again I go to this question like if they went to that pulp paper, would I get more pages? And let yeah. me give you let me give you an example because because this is what you have to think about if it. If it costs three cents a page to do the high gloss page and one cent a page to do the pulp page, it doesn't seem like much difference on an individual book. But when you extrapolate that all out over a big run, suddenly that savings adds up. You know, even like a one to two cent difference or a one or a three to two cent difference, those pennies add up. And I think what we're at, you know, well, this is what I've said. This is why I said the, the goal, the thing comic books need to do is either go all digital at a 99 cent rate or, or, or cheaper rate or like a buck 99. Here's what I'll say. I think there's a lot of working class kids who get 10 bucks a week allowance. I can imagine that. And um, the only problem is they don't have credit cards. But, you know, I mean, that's a whole other, it's a whole other bag of hammers when you get into how to, how to distribute the digital. But you do like a buck ninety nine for a digital copy, or even a digital copy of some old book, or you know, you work it. I think the math can be done. The problem is for these comic book companies. I think that they're that they don't know how that they've gotten to a point where they're not quite sure how to write books for kids anymore. That kids can access, feel smart, and then go on from you know. Um, you know, as I was saying about the Wait What podcast, they were talking today about, you know, what is like one of my central comic book books, because it is literally the first one I ever, not not literally the first one, everyone, but like one of the first ones that got me into the superhero universe, which is, you know, um, tied to this, which is when the Invisible Woman first becomes Malice. And Daredevil comes in and says, why are you fighting an amorphous blob? Because he sees the force field, not Sue Storm. And that's, you know, this whole thing. And they're like, and they're, and, and they're on one hand praising it and then just tearing it down because it's not, it's not as good as like a book that was written today. It's like, well, of course it's not good, as good as a book that, you know, he's going to say, I love the, the song of Gilgamesh. Honestly, it's, it's a bit predictable. You know, I mean, it's the first book ever written. So it's, you know, a lot of the stuff that we think of as tropes today, I mean, they were all fresh when, when Gilgamesh was written. They're like, hey, let's have, let's have the, 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 the wild man from the woods and, and the strict king buddy up. And now they've got to fight crime, you know, and, and that's, you know, that was this, that was this revolutionary concept at the time when the Song of Gilgamesh is written. But, um, you know, now we look at it and we say it's it's cliche. Um, but you have to remember that sometimes these cliches were actually first started with these people that are first making the cliche. I, I, um, love, the, I love the burn Fantastic Four stuff. And it's like, you know, if, yeah. you know, with, with like Stan Lee before him and like all these writers who created these stories, I mean, they may seem dated these days but i mean you needed that foundation you wouldn't be where you're at now you wouldn't have a marvel cinematic universe if you didn't have these stories before, you know no i mean not at all and i think that is emphasized in homecoming because what you can say about homecoming is it is exactly like the 60s spider-man but set in set, set in a world with black people um you know <laughs> You know, it's a set in a world where, oh, you know, we are aware of that there are, that that there's more than one color in 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 in, in that, that that a colorist can use more than one color for flesh tone. So because it's the flesh tone doesn't mean that's what you use. Um, although that was an interesting thing I've noticed. Um, I noticed this actually in Occupy Avengers, but I have seen it in a couple other places as well. There are Black Hydra agents. Well, remember they're not Nazis. You know, well, well, but you know, this is actually a thing that Marvel has made this point, which I think is actually an important point when you discuss this concept of fascism. 
it is so easy to fall in a and let me give you an example this is what i call anti-israeli anti-semitism the idea of anti-semitism is a real issue and very often people who say I don't agree with the politics of the state of Israel will say, well, you're just anti-Semitic. And well, in truth, and this is the, this is the crux of the biscuit in truth. There are a lot of anti-Semites who don't agree with the politics of Israel. There is an argument to be made that you can have disagreements with the policies of Israel and not be an anti-Semite. And it is a very, because it turns out, and racial dynamics, way more complicated than what you might usually find in a comic book. Um, That there are not just heroes and just villains, that everyone is a hero and everyone is a villain in every story that they happen to appear in. Mm -hmm. You know, um, for what it's worth, there are a lot of people, and I'm sure Donald Trump and Donald Trump Jr., see themselves as heroes. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, in the real world, who sees them? Who? I mean, I'm sure there's a few, but who sees themselves as the bad guy? Exactly. I mean, which is, which is one of the most, which I think is one of the most endearing parts of the Netflix Daredevil series, the first one, when the Kingpin basically says, oh, wait, I'm the bad guy. <laughs> you know? You know, it says, I just realized... I'm the evil man who sets upon people and I embrace that. And just this idea of embracing villainy is such a revolutionary notion that I don't care that there are people that are hurt by what I do. It is for, it is for my reasons I do it. And that is, that is why that's revolutionary. Now I'm going to tell you something in 20 years, people are going to say, Oh, what a trope. The villain recognizes he's a villain, uh, you know, but it's revolutionary when Netflix Daredevil did it. And it really is revolutionary when you think about it. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, granted, it is. I mean, look at popular uh, entertainment now. I mean, TV shows, movies, comic books. I mean, it's, I mean, especially the comics these days, you're not getting the villain, you know, the, the must, mustache twirling villain who's like, oh, I'm evil for evil's sake. You know, everyone has, you know, either some tragedy in their backstory or they have, you know, an agenda. And, and, you know, that, no, one's bad for, no one's bad for evil's sake anymore. Yes. And, and to that extent, I remember a, a, a bit from Berkeley Breath. Um, in which Steve Dallas, which from an old Bloom County, in which Steve Dallas gets access to a time machine and <laughs> goes back in time, and 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 the 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 image that you remember is Steve. Da- I don't know if you ever read Bloom County, but Steve Dallas is a lawyer, and he goes back in time and realizes that there's all these lawsuits that people never brought. And he's sitting in a bunker with Hitler and he says, Hitler, put down that gun and repeat after me. And Hitler says, I'm a victim too. And just, <laughs> no, it, it's like, honestly, it is just the most crazed, offensive thing you could think of. And I will always respect Berkeley Breath for, for going there, for saying that, you know, victimization culture expanded out says that, yes, Hitler is a victim too. Because he did have a... Sh- lousy childhood by most accounts and you know and all these things and you but at the end of the day we as intelligent people realize that that's not an excuse and we do have to rise above our situations but then again if any of us were raised as hitler was raised would we be hitler who knows you know human life is too complex but anyway that's not even a point to be made but uh Um, but but here's my thought i mean i can i can see hydra um you know, having people of color, you know, as, you know, as ground troops, because, you know, even like a Nazi racist like uh, Strucker or Zemo might be like, okay, you people of color stand up front, you know, you're our human shield. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to go you a little bit better because there actually is historical, uh, there is actual historical precedent for this. Mm -hmm. When the Nazis invaded, you know, because part of one of the Nazi goals is to, 
reclaim the Ottoman Empire. And there is all this, there is there are documentations about explaining why Turks aren't Arabs. And for what it's worth, this and to give you an understanding of colonialism, this is an issue that exists to this day throughout all of the Middle East about the difference between Turks and Persians and 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 other members, other persons from the Arabian Peninsula. And these different groupings that each group has said, we're from this group. Because, of course, what happens is, is that these Europeans come in and they pick who they decide is going to be. Essentially, they, 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 they confer whiteness upon you. And in that whiteness, you now get to be part of the group. And so you get to have your power over others. And... You know, the, 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 the perniciousness of racism is a real problem because it is the, and you know, it's, it's easy to pick on white people just because we were the most recent people to do it. Um, we, we, we were the ones who did it when the cameras were on. Um, it is a, it is an inherent human trait, uh, differentiating groups of people from other groups of people. And if you want an example of this, you need look no further than the fact that the Irish were horribly oppressed by their English overlords. Um, even though at this point in history, who can tell the difference? Which of course is the most racist thing you can ever say is who can tell the difference between that group and that group. Uh, okay. Not what I wanted to talk to talk about tonight. I wanted to talk about Easter eggs. Um, do you want to put the politics aside for a few minutes and talk about some interesting things from Spider-Man Homecoming and other things that we've seen. Yes, yes. Okay, so now that we're actually going to... So we've talked... It's interesting, you know, honestly, I blame, I blame the guys over at Wait, Wait. Um, if you do start following them, please write to them and say, hey, I heard about you on this obscure podcast called Super Connectivity. And they were talking up about you. They were talking a lot of trash, but they also said, they, oh, I'm glad you enjoyed the book. It's a good book, isn't it? Tristan Wood, Edge of the Venom, verse 2, uh, featuring Gwenpool. Which I thought was a very good book, um, and he just had to tell me they just finished the book, so he's very happy about that. Um, what? So, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You think you cut out for okay, a second? Okay, I know. I, 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 okay, yeah. I saw like a mute button come up on my thing. So Jason just finished Edge of the Venom verse, and he had to tell me. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a good book. I actually, I'm kind of, in, I kind of want to read the second book and the, uh, the third book in the Edge of the Venom verse now. It's like, oh, that was interesting. I'm sure the next one won't be as good because it won't feature Gwenpool. But there might be some more interesting story to come along. Anyway, um, here's what I want to, so here was the thing. This is what I actually want to talk about today was Easter eggs in film that spawn fascinating fan theories. And my fan theory from Homecoming based off of a little tiny statement by Happy Hogan at the very end of the film, not at the very end, but like, you know, near when he's loading up the last, when he's loading up the, when he's loading up the last load of things. And he says, okay, we have, we have the old Hulk. He he says the old Hulkbuster armor. Which is interesting because it means that there's now a new Hulkbuster armor. Um, he's not right now, Ben. Oh, fine. Say hey, Ben. Say hi, Ben. Hi. That's Ben. He's saying hi. Okay. Hi, Ben. Okay. <laughs> yes. He says we're loading up the old Hulkbuster armor. Mm-hmm. He says the and he tries to say the 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 Nordic word, but he says um, Thor's belt. Which is, of course, Thor's you know belt that increases his strength dramatically, and then he says, "And the new Captain America prototype shield, or the new or Cap's new prototype shield." And here is the thing, he says, "Cap's new prototype shield." Now we know Tony had a prototype shield. Because he had a shield in the first Avengers. Or not the first Avengers. The first... um, One second. 
in the first uh, Iron Man that shows up. And in the second Iron Man, they make a point that it's not the real shield, it's something else. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, sorry, this prescription's being told that they're done. Um, so, so, so do you think? So do you think they're he? They they do have a new Captain America in the wings. Well, that's what I'm thinking. If he's making a new shield, there has to be a new Captain America. And do you, and do you think is he trying to create like another vibranium shield, or is it going to be one of those uh, energy deals? Uh, I'm not sure what it is, but whatever it is, it's going to be interesting. And I think because that's that's the thing I think about it is if there is it because here's the thing. We know Tony is looking for new heroes. Mm -hmm. And this is what I think is interesting, that the fact that it's associated with Thor's belt of strength. Okay, and that's the thing. They reference Thor's belt of strength. Mm -hmm. Now we know, is Tony going to have Thor's belt of strength? If Tony knows Thor has a belt that makes him even stronger... It, it, given how he treated the Infinity Stone, is he going to just let that sit in his lab and not look at it? <gasps> are we going to get a bunch of uh, villain Avengers? Like, are we going to get like a John Walker, Captain America? I think Red Norvell wore that belt of power. Yeah. Oh, well, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we're going to get that Tony has because here because here's a deeper aspect of it, and of course CBR recently. Agreed with me after my podcast. Hmm, how did that happen? <laughs> I know you're listening, CBR. That Tony is the villain of Spider-Man Homecoming. That Tony is because, and really, when you think about it, every aspect, everything that ba- that's bad happens happens because of Tony. Tony screws screws over uh, Tombs, which makes him turn to supervillainy. Tony, you know, empowers uh, Spidey. And then leaves him to his own devices, which, of course, leads Spidey into all kinds of bad outcomes in his life. And, you know, for what it's worth, it's an interesting comparison to what we were talking about earlier about when you're a kid and you're like comics and when you're an adult and like comics. Tony imagines that when he was Peter's agent, if someone had given him an Iron Man armor, he would have been always perfect with with everything he did even as he knows even as an adult with his iron man armor he hasn't been perfect but he's willing to overlook that just to tear down peter well like Um, going back to what we said before can you really blame tony or do you blame his upbringing from uh howard ah you know you know i still want to know who maria was I'd like, you know, there's this big fan community that wants Mar- Maria to be Angie from the, um, from the uh, uh, Agent Carter series. Mm-hmm. That if Tony's mom is Angie, that if her real name is like Maria, Angela, whatever, that she goes by Angie just because she feels Maria is too ethnic and Angie is more anglicized it's which you know it's ang is right in it so it's a little bit more anglicized and she's an actress so you got to think about that kind of well days. i don't know if we're going to get anything with his parents cuz even like the uh what's his face who plays his father now as uh he's on preacher yeah but he's the star of preacher uh, people do more than one show that's I true mean, i mean that's the thing it's like we're in a, we're we're in a we're in a golden age of tele- television but it's also very incestuous where everyone is pretty much do have this working company of actors who go on everybody else's shows and everyone shows this. This is why freaking characters from games of throne are showing up on, um, Dr. Who, because they're like, Oh yeah. You know, we need an actor that our nerds are going to recognize. So I'll go to someone from games of game of thrones. So, you know, so basically the guy on preacher is there because he's, because he's Howard Stark on Agent Carter. So it's like, look at that. So it's not like Marvel can't bring him back. They come back for Carter, you know. Um, True. You know, and uh, for what it's worth, it is what it's worth. Um, But the reality is, is that I think this idea that Tony is trying to recreate Avengers that are going to blow up in his face. 
-hmm. that might be an interesting aspect in civil war or not civil war uh infinity war uh yeah the first one that basically tony has had to create his own avengers so he's got he's got this and then he's going to get you know some guy with the new shield because of course this is going to be important we're going to see this in black panther if Black Panther took back the shield, he said, no, this is what on the shield. Mm-hmm. I don't know how your father got Wakanda's vibranium, but we're taking it back because not your thing, you know? Um, well, that's what I'm thinking, too. That if the new Captain America might have one of those photonic energy shields, because didn't Coulson pull something like that out on, yeah, on Agents yeah, of Shield? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Coulson had the photonic shield. Um Love photonic shields. Um, so I mean, they would, could they could they could tie that in, be like, you know, that was Stark tinkering around with the photonic shield. Yeah, well, well, absolutely. I mean, honestly, obviously, they have photonic shields in this universe. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly what Tony is going to create, who knows? It'll be better than just a photonic shield because it's probably going to be a shield that has some kind of. It's probably going to be a shield that has some. You know what it's going to be? It's going to be a shield that's going to be refer, reference. That's going to be similar to uh, Eric Shield from Dungeons and Dragons, if you remember the old cartoon. Uh, the Cavalier Shield that could create the invisible force field. Mm. So it'll probably be, it's, it'll look like a shield, but it's going to create that photonic shield around it. And that's what gives it its power. So you can expand well, you, the shield. You can well, like use it aggressively without having to throw it like the way Cap does. Well, yeah, you know? but, well that's like in um, when Mark Wade was writing Captain America and he came up with that. Yeah, he could alter the shape he can make weapons out of the energy he can make like a full-on force field and yeah instead exactly. of throwing it you, you shoot it off like a laser and then you just like re- exactly to another one yeah and and i think i th- but i think it's going to have that shield shape mm-hmm. so it's going to look have the look of a captain america shield but it's also going to have that photonic power around it yeah and then he's going to give him he's going to give him some kind of juice and it's going to be john walker and then you're going to have a different hawkeye maybe Maybe we're gonna get. Maybe we're gonna get. Uh, you know what? Oh man, mark my words. The next Avengers series is gonna be Dark Avengers. Ooh. So when you get your so the start of Infinity War, it's gonna be Thanos coming, and and you're gonna see all of the Dark Avengers. You're gonna see. You're gonna see John, but they're not gonna be like the Dark Avengers. They're not yeah. going to be like actual villains. Maybe one or two. Um, <laughs> Got to find the villains we found so far that we could use in this. But you're going to see. You're going to see. Oh, you might see Mister Hyde. <laughs> He's a known superhuman. Um, but you're going to see Tony Stark. He's going to have John Walker, and he's going to have Hawkeye's brother. Who grew up in the circus with him is just as good, but maybe is a little less. Uh, concerns you're gonna have, and of course you're gonna have Spider Man in his group, and that of course is gonna be that big conflict. Is Spider Man like Stark? I don't think these guys are superheroes. You could just see Tom Holland looking at uh, uh, Adam saying, like, uh, you know, Mister Stark, I'm not sure these guys are heroes. I'm not sure we're on the right side here, you know. And uh, you know, you're gonna have the Super Soldier Serum breaking down in uh, John Walker. They might actually really go out on a limb and make it William Burnside. Hmm. You know, and what'll be fun is if they get Chris Evans to play William Burnside. That'll be fun. Um, you know, maybe even adding in a Bucky for him. You know, <laughs> or they could go with Battlestar there. You know, and say mm-hmm. you know Battlestar and John. Wall- I- oh, I'd love to see Battlestar in the Marvel universe. I was going to say, what if they had Moonstone? But what if they put Captain Marvel there? Like, what if some of, like, at least one or two of these people become like? Because they said that stuff's going to change after Infinity War mm-hmm. and whatever that second part is. So, like, what if they have Captain Marvel on that Tony Stark team? But then afterwards, she moves on to like the real mm-hmm. Avengers. Maybe Tom Holland, Spider Man moves on to the new Avengers. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm certain Tom Holland, Spider Man. Like, like I said, I, right now I'm thinking Tom Holland, Spider Man is going to be. The conscience of the Marvel Universe going forward. Well, I think they said they, I think that I heard somewhere they said they're going to build a lot around him coming come Phase Four. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, because he's the youngest guy, and I can see mm-hmm. you know, and you know what it'll be. Here's what. So here's my prediction. So you have Captain Marvel, who is a military person. You have John Walker, who's a military person. 
you have Rhodey who's still on the team, and you're going to have them Ooh. building out these military people to be their superhuman captains, America. You know, uh, Stark is going to be using every bit of tech he can get his hands on because he knows something's coming. Because for what it's worth, Thor left, and he told him he had to leave because he said, Infinity show Stones have been showing up on Earth. I got to find out why. And that's the last words Thor gave to Tony. Tony isn't going to sit there and ignore it. No. Tony's going to say, oh, yeah, Infinity Stones. Okay, right. Okay. Uh, Thor's off. Let me replace everybody. Because in, the, because in the I, next moment, it's like, now Cap is causing me trouble because he's got some kid he's got to fight for. Dude, we're f- defending the world. So yeah. Tony is going to stand up and say, okay, I need a new Cap. I have a vision. Thank goodness I have a vision. Um, I got, I got a Spider-Man, a, but, he, but I got a super connection tied all together. Remember, we were talking about you know '90s nostalgia, especially in comics. Mm-hmm. The new team, John Walker, you know '80s '90s creation. Got Jim Rhodes, you know either as War Machine or Iron Patriot. I said Red Norvell with that power belt, but what if we get Thunderstrike? Mm. Well, Masterson, two yeah, recreating a Thor. Oh, oh, I'll give you one better. Ragnarok the Thor clone. There you go. Tony built him. Tony says, I need a Thor. And oh, I can even... He doesn't I have... Cl- get- oh, no, I was yeah. going to say, what if Tony Stark doesn't have... Uh, as Well, except for that belt, well, I don't think he has access to Asgardian uh, weaponry or anything. What if he try? What if Tony tries to create like a... Um, uh, a version of the hammer, but it's not mystical. It's... Uh, it's like a machine. Well, let me give you let me give you one bit. Who says he doesn't have access to Asgardian technology? Let's not forget. Yeah, but if we thanks are to Thor, say, no, no, no. thanks to Thor, thanks to Thor Ragnarok, is Asgard even still there? Or maybe the stuff gets scattered. Ooh. Well, um, well, things have been scattered for millennia, as we know from Agents of Shield, where we see the Berserker staffs hidden in trees all around the world, and and I think this might be this more deeper point is that and oh man you think about it you think about what we saw in in in, um in uh homecoming which is that you have the vulture picking off all the things damage control couldn't grab right but Mm -hmm. damage control grabs most of it so every bit of tech that falls to earth damage control is pulling it together in one location. And we know that damage control is associated with Stark International. So there's nothing that's coming across damage control's desk that isn't also going to Stark. Hmm. So you have this idea that Stark is totally deconstructing all this tech. You know, I mean, yeah, Hydra was getting it too, but you know, Tony's not above taking Hydra tech and repurposing it for his own use. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, so right now, I am thinking right now, these Dark Avengers are what you're looking at. Yeah, it might be Red Norvell, it might be um, Thunderstrike, it might be anybody, it might be Ragnarok, the Thone, the Thor, the, Thone, the Thor clone. Say, it say, might. Oh, I just had another thought. Mm-hmm. You were saying, you know, Tom Holland's Spider-Man might be on this new Avengers team. Mm-hmm. What if he's not? Because he turned Tony Stark down. And if we go all '90s nostalgia, I mean, if you're going to create a Thor clone, what if he, what if he clones uh, Peter Parker, uh, you know, without ben his Riley. consent? Yes, because I saw an article today. They said, I, I'm think I don't know if this was confirmed or not, but I saw it. It was saying. That homemade Spider-Man suit that he wears in the you know in the movies mm-hmm. before t- Tony gives him the high tech suit. Mm-hmm. Originally, they were toying with the idea of making it look like that original Scarlet Spider suit, mm. but they didn't. So, what if they were saving Scarlet Spider for something else? That's 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 an interesting theory. I mean, clone. I mean, well, if he's going to clone Thor, he might clone Spider Man. He might. I mean, if you, you know, if you clone an Asgardian, you can clone an a, a, a human with superhuman powers. Come on. Oh man, what if, what if what if he clones Cap? 
what if that's who William Burnside is? Or what you know, I mean, there are so many ways. I mean, or like, or, or what's his face? Protocide. Oh, protocide. Uh, I love protocide. Um, I'd love to see protocide in there somewhere. Hey, um, hey, I don't think hey. protocide's making it to the movie. I think we might see protocide in Agents of Shield at some point. Maybe, uh, but I mean, you, you could call the clone that. But and you and you made the the point several times about James Rhodes. Remember when he got a new clone mm-hmm. body? You could have a whole clone Avengers. Yeah, well, that's what I'm. Th- I think, you know, I mean, Tony's a little mechanical. You know, I think cloning. I think if you do all clones, it's a little weird. But once Tony cracks cloning, you know he's not going to stop. So yeah, I but think I, I mean cloning might be easier because you don't have to create all these power sets. I mean, if you get some Steve Rogers DNA and there's some Super Soldier serum in there, if you get mm-hmm. some Ford DNA and there's your Asgardian DNA. I'm yeah. sure he's got access, if not access to Peter Parker's DNA, enough readouts from that suit. Well, yeah, I mean, that's an well, you, for what it's worth, they said that um, Kate uh, was recording everything the whole time. Yep. And not for nothing, Peter is a teenage boy. So there's probably uh, DNA everywhere. You always got to go into the gutter with that, Charlie Esser. I had too much apple juice tonight. Um, even, I mean, even with that high tech suit, I mean, Tony could be recording his brainwave patterns. I mean, you can have. Oh, yeah. No, honestly, yeah. Honestly, right now, Tony has enough to build his own Spider-Man. Honestly, oh. Oh. And I mean, the rest of the Avengers have been in that tower. I'm sure there's, you know, hair follicles or something he can use the clones. Here, here, I'm going to give you something fun for Spider-Man. Uh-oh. Okay. Remember when you had the Scarlet Spiders in uh, Avengers Academy? And they had the mm-hmm. three MVP co- uh, Michael Van Patrick clones who were the naturally occurring super soldiers and they all wore the scarlet spider but they were the they were the high tech suit that Tony Stark had created for Spider-Man when Spider-Man unveiled himself mm-hmm. and we see a high tech suit in Tony's uh Avengers compound that he was going to give to Spider-Man what if he creates an AI based on Tom Holland? Hmm. So all of a sudden the Spider-Man's there, but then all of a sudden Tony says, release, you know, un- you know, uh, activate the Scarlet Spider Legion. And you see all those Spider-Man uh, costumes, <laughs> essentially much as we've seen before, but they're all powered by these Tom Holland AIs, uh, basically empty suits of armor, but that, are going to attack for Tony. I mean, there's lo- oh, there's so many ways or, that Tony. What if you get one AI Spider-Man who mm-hmm. maybe there's a problem with the programming starts going dark and it's just like, don't call me Spider-Man, call me Kane. Uh, you know, I don't know. Oh, AI goes evil again. Cause we already did that story. That's what I'm saying that they got to go yeah. cloning. I, I'll, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, cloning is a way to go with this. I mean, I think one of the things it's amazing where we got from just the idea that Tony's working on another Captain America to this entire other conversation, Mm -hmm. but that's the fun of super connections. You know, that's the fun of super connectivity is that we can go, where's the next stage? We create this, then what's the next thing? Then what's the next thing? Then what's the next connection? And uh, when we look at, what Tony can do. And like I said, I do feel that the heroism of Black Panther is going to be mitigated by his duty to Wakanda. I think we're going to find this place going into Avengers Infinity War where you have Black Panther kind of in a dark place, Tony in a dark place. I think Black Panther, the Black Panther movie is probably the best place for this. Mm-hmm. For- you get a couple end credit scenes, maybe one end credit scene. You see Steve Rogers and his group, like making it to Wakanda or something. Maybe you see that, you know, Black Panther is helping them out, at least giving them shelter or whatever, maybe supplying them with stuff, you know, Hawkeye's arrows, whatever, you know, some trick arrows. But uh, then the second scene, you get Tony Stark having a big press conference. And this time there is a big announcement. It's his, his Avengers. Yes. Um, let me give you. So let me so let me put this point. At the end of Cap, Cap's in a dark place. Mm-hmm. At the end of Homecoming, 
Tony's in a dark place. At the end of Black Panther, Black Panther's going to be in a dark place. I think what we're going to be seeing going forward is these three pillars of the Marvel Universe that we're creating here are going to be all in that dark place. And barring a bit from some what ifs, it's going to be Tom Holland's Spider-Man who reminds everyone who they have to be. And that's where we get our Uncle Ben. That's where we get our great power gets comes great responsibility. Because maybe, maybe Thanos gets the Infinity Gauntlet. Maybe he does wipe out half the universe just like in the, in, in, in the stories. And maybe it is up to Tom Holland to bring it back. And, you know, understand and being the only person who is at this point mature enough to be the hero to say, I can put it back just as it was. I'm not going to make it better just for me because I know that's going to be wrong. I know when something is wrong. I don't need to make things better. I just need to make things what they once were. And I think that's a great way to end that fourth Avengers film. And when we get at the end of the fourth Avengers film with a bunch of tired old heroes and Tom Holland and maybe Captain Marvel and maybe, maybe James Roden Falcon. And of course, Hawkeye's still there because the man needs work. Uh, <laughs> and Scarlett Johansson, if they can afford her. Uh, and they say, okay, let's see where we go next. <laughs> Did you say Black Panther? Black Panther? I think Black Panther should be in there. Uh, I think Black, you know, here's the thing. I think that it's going to be hard to really put Black Panther on the Avengers because Black Panther has a day job. Well, I think he's going to be like the Batman. He's going to be like, yeah, I'm not one for teens, but, you know, when you need me, call me. Well, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, speaking of Batman, did you hear they tossed out all of Ben Affleck's poor script? Oh, yeah. They're starting from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Because, well, you know, not for nothing. And, it's not to be a, 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 a drag on poor old Ben Affleck, but Ben Affleck wrote that script based on the Snyder verse. And we're in a Jenkins verse now. We're basically, they said, no, 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 Jenkins won. You know, <laughs> it's sort of how we're really not in a Whedon verse anymore. We're kind of in the, um, ah, who, who did, uh, who did the cap movies? Uh, uh, the Russo brothers. Russo, we're in a Russo verse now. So Marvel's in a Russo verse, um, and DC's in a Jenkins verse. There is, you know, so anything that was written for Snyder verse isn't going to make it. Anything that was written for a Whedon verse isn't going to make it. You know. Well, I think I think the powers at DC there or Warner's, I think they've learned their lesson. It's like, yeah, okay, Batman can be kind of dark, but we really don't need a dark Superman. I mean, Wonder Woman was, I mean, even set in World War One was still lighter than anything that we've, we've put out before. And I mean, look at the numbers yeah. that's hitting. Uh, well, exactly. and, and, and look at look at the numbers, you know, all the Marvel stuff that comes out, even like, you know, yeah, I, I'm sure they would love to have, you know, even one of the one of the lower performing Marvel, you know, mo- well, movies. Well, of course. I mean, you know, not for nothing. We are Kang lives are not so grand that we wish to be in darkness you know we we we, we are, you know our lives are at a point where we would like to be in a place where there is where heroes even when they are conflicted and dark although for what it's worth marvel has been getting darker you know i mean i think that's the thing is marvel uses its darkness as contrast to the light whereas i think whereas i think dc is using darkness as the uh, he went to medieval times as i said did you eat a turkey leg uh no i think it was chicken or turkey they taste different okay um oh it was a thigh okay i hope it was enjoyable um it's probably a chicken thigh then um medieval times you ever go they have the big turkey legs that's that's the thing even though turkeys weren't in medieval europe because they're an american bird it's anyway uh where, where were we um yeah i mean marvel uses its darkness as a contrast to its light dc paints in dark colors and you know isn't isn't painting the light as much as it should and it's like darkness is is a contrast it's not meant to be the the goal but 
that's my take on it. I, I, we didn't even get to my Doc Brown theory. Although I'm going to write up that blog post about how Doc Brown really has a level of genius that really surpasses anyone and probably created the Mr. Fusion that we see at the end of uh, Back to the Future and actually probably made a lot of money off the deal. Uh, um, it's an interesting he, take. take yeah, but do you think he created that from scratch or did he travel to 2015 and kind oh, of... Well, well, Here's what it is. Okay, so so spoilers for my blog post. When Doc Brown says this this sucker is nuclear, and he says we use plutonium, well, there's never any discussion of waste. And what he is doing is he's created a fusion reactor using plutonium to create a super heavy element. Because okay, so to understand, okay, now you're gonna get me talking science. To understand how an element is radioactive, essentially the element decays at a rate, at a very fast rate, faster than elements normally decay at, because they're too large and they can't hold their they can't hold their protons and neutrons together. So a so plutonium has that high radioactivity because it is constantly in this state of decay. However, if he finds a way to create a fusion reaction. So normally what we do is we exploit that rate of decay to create a fission reaction that creates a lot of energy, but most nuclear power plants are essentially just steam generators. You know, they're, you know, um, which even, I mean, but theoretically, if you create a fusion reactor, you can actually convert more matter to energy and then harness that energy. And this is actually the importance of the flux capacitor. The flux capacitor is a device that when uh, you experience, because essentially when you travel through a wormhole, there is a theoretical creation called an electromagnetic flux that will disincorporate any matter or energy that goes through it so that no data can go from the past, to the, from the future to the past, or arguably from the past to the future. But if you had a device that could capacitate that flux and prevent that deconstruction of matter and energy, you could then travel through time. Likewise, you could Bingo. use that flux you could use that flux capacitor to contain the energy of a fusion reaction of plutonium of plutonium. Yes. I need help getting fruit snacks. Okay, we'll get fruit snacks after the conversation. And you would use that that energy harness to power the flux capacitor to create the wormhole to Oh, and interestingly enough, using the plutonium is actually going to create a super heavy element, which may in fact power the wormhole that directs the car. Okay, uh, I'm going to get I'm going to get into more detail with this. I'm actually going to do the math on it and figure out exactly what a super heavy uh, double plutonium would look like to see if it would actually meet the science that I'm trying to create here. But I like the idea, and we'll see where it goes. But that is that is the Easter egg I recently pulled out that. The Mr. Fusion reactor that is using non, non-traditionally non physical materials to create that fusion must have been created by someone who had created a fusion reaction earlier. And it is how he has created this device that allows, allows his car to work. And that, as Mr. Fusion says, that he then gave his science to the world to say, here's a way that you can have really cheap, free energy going forward. And so Doc Brown, I think, actually creates that utopia you see in 2015 of the Ooh. clean, special world because he had already created that technology and just needs to go back into the past to establish everything. And since he has a time machine, it's relatively easy. Okay. Oh, I think those are enough super connections for one week, Phil, unless you have anything else to add. No, I'm good. Okay, this has gone on way too long, well over an hour, and even though it was a yell at the wait what guys for going on too long, but hey, hey <sighs> we're going to go on a while tomorrow. If you want, invite them on. Hash it out with uh, them. Wait. You know what? I'm going to have to try that. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Those guys are like famous. I don't know if I could. I don't know. They have a podcast, Phil, that I listen to. You know, <laughs> Clearly, they're, they're way more successful than I am. Um... <laughs> Oh, it's okay. I, you know what? I just may reach out to them. I have to get my computer working. I don't do the computers as well as I used to as a kid. <sighs> anyway. 
Uh, Phil, if people would like to write to you about all the things that go on in the universe, where can they find you? Um, if I would like to write to me, I will write to me at um, <laughs> nightwingpdp at gmail.com. On Twitter, I am at nightwingpdp. Uh, yeah, if you are the uh, wait what guys or anybody else who would like to be interviewed on uh, Capes and Lunatics, yeah, contact me uh, any of those ways. Okay. And of course, you can always write to me in the old fashioned email way the way our moms and paws once did at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And of course, follow me on the uh, Twitters at Charlie Esser. That's C H A R L I E E S S E R. Look for the two E's in the middle for quality. And of course, always, uh, Phil, what's our phone number on Capes and Lunatics? Ah, our voicemail, if you'd like to. Uh... This goes for all the shows on Capes and Lunatics. If you would like to uh, send us your thoughts on anything, 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. Yes. So if you would like to communicate with us as the way our grandpas and grandmas once did, you can call us on the teleophone. And we would love if you did. Okay, kids. Thank you for connecting with us. Remember, it's not just connections. It's super connections. <laughs> Please connect with us again. <laughs>